Haley came to see me just a few weeks ago, showed me something I thought he should share with you. I said, if you can do it in 10 minutes, just do it in 10 minutes. I'm going to be strict on time right to the very end. Okay. Larry Keeley, who's been here year after year. Wasn't that sweet music, inspiring and thoughtful? And I don't know about anybody else, but it made me kind of cry. The, um, the thing I wanted to share is some things I've been thinking about lately about innovation leadership. I wanted to do it particularly at this TED because Richard, in stringing together a dozen of the very best information architects in the world, has been trying to show us the power of using effective imagery to convey understanding. And for the last nine or 10 months, what I've been trying to figure out is how you do that and also do it at web speed. How you do it while thinking about making judgments quickly about things that are important when you sense you've got no time. And so Richard's taught us about finding patterns in information. And I want to add the idea of finding them really swiftly, not so beautifully as the information architects and the Understanding USA book have done, but still quick and powerful and useful. And to address this, I've been going around the world and talking to leaders, CEOs mostly, and asking them about what they're doing about innovation. How many of you sense that we're in the most innovative time in the history of the world? Show of hands quickly. Okay, in the other rooms, that, in this room we got about uh, 40%. It's real controversial. People say it's one of the top three or four times in the history. I'm often sort of confounded by these kinds of questions on the screen behind me. You know, what is it that caused CBS, the world's most powerful news organization, to completely miss the idea of CNN? Tom Brokaw had talked about it movingly. What causes AT&T to completely move at, miss out on the AOL phenomenon? Things like that. When you talk to leaders around the world and ask them what innovation is, they always think it's a hot product, right? They think it's something like this. In this audience, of course, we have the wisdom to think that it's at least a platform with an increasing returns business, right? But people are thinking about what is it that I can make that will get me and the developmental team on the cover of Fortune magazine, and guess what? When you really understand innovation, this turns out to be the least useful, least likely pathway to success. There are, in fact, multiple types of innovation, and getting a clear head about what is meant by this topic under, means that you have to understand innovation as a viable business concept, something that throws off enough free cash flow to earn you the privilege of doing it over again. The second thing is that you have to embrace the idea of different types. When we took 3,000 things that everyone would agree would be innovative and clustered them down, we found 10 types. I'll show you those in just a moment. It's well understood now, thanks to Clayton Christensen's excellent book, that we've got different degrees of innovation. The idea of sustaining innovations, 95, 96% of all innovations make the world a little bit better in known ways. 4% of them are from the Monty Python school of innovation, right? And now for something completely different. And the last thing is we have to understand there are different scales of innovation. You know, no matter how 3M counts it, it's not the same thing to develop a different color post-it note as it is to create a Hubble orbiting space telescope and understanding those differences is reasonably fundamental. After a long, long, long piece of research, here's what we've learned. If you want to have innovation leadership in any category, you pay attention to three things. Pick the right types of information, uh, of innovation rather. Again, I'll show you those in just a moment. Pick some number. Most people think they're looking for one thing. Typically, you're looking for 10, 20, 30 simultaneous things. And then, like Gordon Moore and his colleagues have done at Intel, pick a rate of innovation that is arbitrarily double or triple the industry norm and stick to it over many, many years. That causes winning. What are those 10 types of innovation? By the way, these are all free. We're giving them away on the website, so don't worry about trying to get it written down. Products aren't nothing. They're important, but people that think they're looking for a Volkswagen Beetle, an iMac, a Palm Pilot, are missing other things, like the idea of a Lego set, a product system, services, 
You know, some 15 years ago, we learned to add processes, two types. This is Jim Champy's work and Michael Hammer's work, core processes and enabling processes. We've learned to innovate and channel brand and customer experience. And the two that are most elaborate, most important, and frankly, the highest reward are innovations in business models and networking. I'm going to stretch all those out for you in a row, tell you that really people tend to innovate most in a column when what they should be doing is innovating across these different types. Here are the 10 types of innovation in a row. I'm going to now show you in about, uh, about 10 seconds the difference between planning innovations in big companies and little companies. Okay? Big companies all around the world are taught to pay attention to their core competencies. They're, thought to, they're told to pay attention to what they make and how they make it. So they think about that as the basis of what they're going to address. This has been taught in business schools now for 20 years. Startup companies in, in uh, the valley, not far from where we sit, don't think this way. They don't have core competencies. What they got is 3.2 weeks to the time when they completely run out of capital. Okay? <laughs> so what they're doing is they're thinking about a business model and a customer experience. Even today, you go talk to Jeff Bezos and you say, yo, Jeff, what's the deal? He says, you know, I don't care what I sell, as long as it's got this sort of scalable business model and I, I'll redecorate the store for every customer that comes in. Right? Totally different way to think. Now, why is that important to us in information design? Because 10 types of innovation is too many to keep in your head. And what we've done, most of the time when I come here, I bring you a gift created by the underpaid world of cultural anthropologists, social scientists. Today, I'm bringing you a gift created by the even more underpaid world of library scientists. What you're seeing behind me is a spreadsheet built up of literally millions of individual announcements in the personal computer and peripheral industry over 10 years. So you're seeing those same 10 types of innovation over 10 years and a sedimentized layer of individual announcements. Why is this important? Because it turns out that no company sends out a press release that says, we will continue to do today, Saturday, precisely what we did yesterday, Friday. Okay? They send out announcements of something that's different. When you learn to look those up in the right way, you discover things. What you immediately discover in this case is it's an industry dominated by engineers. They're all saying, we got to have the latest you know, clock speeds, processing power, display qualities, memory qualities, everything else. That's why you see this thing in the middle. It looks like the north face of Everest. It's also why you see, way over here on the left, that Michael Dell managed to make himself spectacularly wealthy, changing the business model. In every industry we've studied, one player usually has. Compaq, confused about that, keeps thinking they'll process engineer themselves to greatness. When you buy a computer from Michael Dell, he gets positive seven days cash flow. When you buy it from Compaq, they get negative 38 days cash flow. Right? It's a totally different business. Now think about the airplanes you'll be on later this very same day. Right? Many of you. What we discover in this case is that the customer experience side is, as we all have come to really believe, horrifying, right? <laughs> we get extruded through a series of indignities. They don't think of it as a product business at all. What they're worried about is these processes here, which is 39,000 price changes a day in North America alone, okay, just to convince you to take a plane. Now, the reason I wanted to do this for you is because it's possible to compare any industry against any other. Here's the innovation patterns in sunglasses over the last 10 years. Looks like a suburban lawn with occasional patches of crabgrass. Okay? <laughs> These are all carefully normalized so that you can compare any industry to any other. It is not surprising that the people at Microsoft living in this world have over the last three or four years found lots of other sleepier worlds to go participate in. They do this with a relish that causes them to spend a disproportionate amount of time with our federal judiciary department, but <laughs> it's really easy to understand why they would be kind of good at something and move to another arena. Now, Richard said he's particularly interested in the healthcare problem. This is what, when I went to visit him, he said he wanted to understand, you know. And so, in two days' time, 
we decided to split the world of healthcare into the one that was so ably analyzed by Uwe as a social political transformation system, and another one that we think is emerging. The one that might just finally give us this promise of longer lives, healthier lives, and different quality of life while we're living. Let's take a look at this. The healthcare field, this is the innovation pattern of healthcare. The vast majority of that huge black leap there is all about the processes that Uwe described to become managed care practitioners. Customer experience is horrifying. The quality of the innovations and products is terrible. Business models have got a tiny little bubble. This is a trillion dollars worth of economic value in this country. Contrast that now with life sciences, a mere $18 billion industry. When they're normalized, you find out that the life sciences business says, you know, we're going to change this world. This is what we would call, when you analyze this thing, this gives you, if you're in this business and you see this one coming, you have the sort of reaction best described by Astro, the Jetsons dog, right? <laughs> ruh <-roh>! And <laughs> when you really get it, the thing that's interesting about it, I'm just going to give you a little tiny movie here so that you can see the differences between these two. They are really very different worlds. And the one that's coming. On the, on the left is the one that's going to pay the biggest dividends. And if you're on the right dealing with that political, cultural, confusing, changing mess, then you need to think through a way to be more innovative and more relevant and to create a decent, halfway decent experience. By the way, this one on the left, huge problem coming. I'll predict it now just from these visual patterns. The huge problem is the same one that has happened in the genetic engineering world of of food, nobody likes the stuff. Okay, They have failed to understand how to make this an interesting idea for people, an interesting brand, and offered up with interesting experiences. That's going to hurt that field in just a few years from now. Anyway, that's the end of a way to think about any industry quickly to give you insights about the innovation patterns they're dealing with. Gives you a sense of the terrain. By the way, we've done this for 30 industries. We've given them all away, as we usually do on our website, uh, doblin.com, D-O-B-L-I-N. So help yourselves and do something useful with it. Thank you very much.